everyone, I'm Rahim Munir, and today I am with Professor Harold Ade. Uh, he's a good night innovation a distinguished professor at North Carolina State University. So while he's here at, uh, at the conference organized by Cal Solar Center, so we thought to talk to him about the organic photovoltaic work uh, currently done in his lab, and he's, he's one of the masters in this field. So thank you for joining us today. You're most welcome. We, so we are very happy. So let's start with the general uh, topic of OPV. That why it's very important uh, as a research topic uh, in this in this field right now. Yes. So from my angle, you know, obviously OPV, organic photovoltaics, is uh, one of the many uh, power conversion technologies for light to current or electrons, and. Um, so one does indeed have to ask the question, why yet another method or another technology? Um, clearly silicon is uh, very successful, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, and uh, perovskites uh, are having a very strong showing these days with very high efficiencies. There are, however, a couple of things that these technologies cannot do, and uh, chiefly amongst them is um, color control and semi-transparency. And so these are areas where we think there continues to be an important opportunity for the uh, OPVs. Um, one of the projects we have is the integration of these OPVs with greenhouses. And um, there, obviously, if you were to have a silicon cell, it would block all the light. Yeah. Okay, and the same is uh, mostly true for the perovskites, even though they are trying to explore also semi-transparency. But uh, the greenhouses, um, which is sort of a special form of building integration or integrated OPV rather than standalone uh, photovoltaics as a power plant that, that uh, you know, um, powers your air conditioner during the middle <laughs> of the day and your light at night, um, that uh, it's sort of... But it's beyond architectural, in, the, in that sense, the, the building integration for the greenhouses. And, um, so I'll, I'll keep going on, I think, <laughs> even though you're not asking me any further questions right now. No, it's a very interesting yeah. point you raised yeah. that you are working on a greenhouse projects. So yeah. what are the recent advancements in the field of OPV and what could be the future direction? Yeah, so, so let me elaborate a little bit more first on, on sort of this idea on the greenhouse. And uh, obviously we all know that the plants are not black. They don't <laughs> absorb all the light, okay? They're green it's the reflected part and so they mostly absorb red light okay and then uh, they use a little bit of the far blue and the ultraviolet for um, regulation which direction to grow when to germinate and those kind of things so but for the power generation for the plant mostly it's the red and then uh, so if you have the opportunity and that's what you have in the organics where you can be through the molecular design uh, harvest only certain colors, um, you can use the green light and the yellow and most of the blue to generate power and some of the infrared as well. And um, greenhouses for the most part they get way too hot in certain areas, um, particularly uh, in southern US. Um, so. They're actually very energy intensive. In the summer you would need to cool them and in the winter you need to heat them during the night. And so we are looking at this, uh, including the economic analysis, uh, to see whether this is, uh, and under what circumstances the organic photovoltaics can be integrated into the greenhouses. Um, and there's sort of an interesting synergy here. It's not just power, but um, you can imagine that you sort of have uh, zero energy farming and at the same time you have um, water control which is very critical. That's what the greenhouses give you, okay? Yeah. You contain an enclosure and so in places in desert Saudi Arabia, southern Spain, that may be a very critical yeah. technology. Yeah. That's right. And then so it's, but then, you know, Yes, you want to preserve the water, but then it gets so hot that you have a problem. So uh, taking some of that power out by using the light for a power generation that the plant doesn't need will help you to cool it and then that makes it sort of more sustainable. And 
you could possibly integrate into these things also infrared heat management yeah. for example um, at the same time and, and so that's the project that we got funding for and that we find most exciting right now we have a large grant over four years with the National Science Foundation that includes um, a wide range of researchers from the OPB manufacturing synthesis part. We have a lifetime cycle analysis person on it to look at economic models. We have um, plant engineers and uh, greenhouse people so we can look at the impact of this. Now you modulate the light, it's no longer white. How does the plant respond? And um, then we have genetic engineers that can possibly tune the absorption of the plant by tuning the chlorophyll and or the expression of the genes to be able to thrive even in low light condition. So that's a diverse group you have. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a very exciting project <laughs> oh, and, nice. uh, and it, it's sort of, um, I think, it's a window that uh, OPB has and um, the part of the window was also created with the recent innovation of novel non-following small molecule acceptors. So this is a very exciting new technological scientific development where for 20 years fullerenes have dominated as acceptors and uh, with it there were limitations on how to optimize materials and now now it's easy to get 12 or 13 percent, you see that in many, many labs. And part of that is because of this revolution that comes with the non-fullerene acceptors. And so um, we, have, we know that uh, some labs, these are unpublished results, we, we are at 15 percent. And um, so, you know, at that point, 15% for OPV versus uh, lead containing perovskites at 22 or something that blocks things completely like uh, silicon. There is now an opportunity. There is uh, the efficiencies out there and um, but we still need to check and engineer stability. So we are at that next level of, of uh, turning this into a technology. That's good to know. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, talk to you a bit, a bit more about that. When, when do you see the commercialization aspect of, uh, of OPV and uh, like, the, so like, the, like the research and the commercialization aspect of, of OPV? Yeah, that's challenging for me to answer directly because I'm so interested in the fundamental science. So I have uh, only limited visibility on the commercialization. Now clearly, historically, the field was overly enthusiastic and you had commercial companies like Konalka that try to work with one material system, referred, you know, of the P3HT PCBM and it was so low efficiency so complicated to reproduce that it didn't work but now we as i earlier said we have um, i would say 20 systems different donors different acceptors they all give fairly good efficiency um, so over 12 percent and I, i'm sure we will see in the next couple of years uh, many systems over 15 percent and at that point you can then really think about upscaling the synthesis yeah. which is what you need in order to be uh, mass, produce. mass produced right and look we, we know Merck is um, they having eight percent devices that are stable I think it's eight percent um, and they they upscaled things to the 12 kilogram right so it, it can be done um, and um, so we have commercial products out there and so in that sense uh, I, I, I think the commercialization is already there right it's just the question of you know whether the cost of the product is will be competitive enough right it will clearly never be used for a power plant yes. but for uh, I think the specialty applications building integration ambient light harvesting where the OPV 6L in particular well 
um, those are all very good products and yeah you know I have sort of a, a pipe dream down the road where you could imagine the following scenario and and part of the this was uh, made obvious to me when my wife was in the hospital so she had the problem appendicitis was in the hospital for a couple days and then uh, what happens right you're on five different things all with cables and that's what she absolutely hated okay is being hung up to the cables and so you know down the road it would be incredibly interesting to see whether and what do these things do they usually monitor a bunch of things right they monitor heartbeat they monitor the oxygen ratio in your blood and temperature and those things so could you imagine where you have integrated sensors where part of that patch flexible patch patient comes in you strap it on them and then when they leave you dump it into the garbage and burn it um, where that patch would have as part of the function an OPV that would harvest energy from the ambient light would have a little bit of energy storage would have a sensor and maybe a communication and, and so you know I think it's in those applications where you have all printed technology and flexible technology where sort of um, OPVs will have an opportunity. Um, so so it would be more those kind of applications that I can envision and um, I, I think it, given that we already have sort of 15% in the research lab and uh, 6 or 8% with uh, 4 gram upscale. So batch sizes of kilograms, right, by the bucket commercially, um, both these fronts will, will keep moving and uh, I think it will only require um, sufficient engineering and effort. And um, so I don't understand the, econ our team doesn't yet fully understand the economics in, engineer in, in, in the greenhouses. You know, there I think costs will be very critical. But sort of in the healthcare industry, cost usually is not a problem. Yeah. You know, the uh, people. Uh, yeah, I, I think patient comfort. Yeah, that, that's patient I comfort. If we can yeah. add to patient comfort, yeah. they would pay a lot. So that, that those economics yeah. at some point need to also be evaluated. Um, Thank you for that. It's very helpful insights. So just to end this interview, I would like to ask you a, a, bit, a bit of a general question that uh, what would you advise for the young scientists who are starting their career in science? So what would be your advice to them? Look, my advice generally is, and I did that with my cousin and my uh, nephews and whoever comes to me, is, the, is generic, and that is to follow your heart, okay? Um, what that, whatever that means to that person, you need to figure out what it is you're excited about. Um, certainly, if you do research, um, I, you know, so it depends, of course. If, if, you, if you do research and get a degree so you have a job and get money, that's one thing. But what excites me is, is um, and what I try to encourage is sort of, will uh, to focus on meaning meaning not expediency money is expediency but meaning in life and doing research that is helpful and at the same time satisfying uh, is something that hopefully they can find and this is saying in the US and uh, you know if you if you really love your what you do, let me know. You don't need I, to work. You don't need to <laughs> work a day in your life. Okay, so it's those kind of things, really, and 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 um, you know, I I don't think of what I what I do certainly not what I do as a job. Okay, it's a calling, and and it has to be a calling because how else can you work so hard? 
if you if you don't really if this isn't calling for you okay That's right. so so I'd like to you know for them to see if this is really calling to them and um, if it's not then that's okay but then at least they need to make that assessment okay and uh, because that then determines what they should be doing yeah. because if you just want to go into industry and if I say that you know it sounds a little bit um, putting it down but it is not right if you want to go to industry um, let's say then you really need to be more interested in a skill base because that is what the industry wants from you okay and then you have less choice because they tell you what to do and they they you become part of their system and the value that you bring to them depends on your skill base not necessarily what precisely you have done whereas if you stay on the research track then you need to bring that passion and then you need to be more narrow and deep um, so it, it's that advice figuring out what it what it is because that will determine how you need to approach what you do as a student Perfect. Um, thank you thank you so much for joining us today it's it's a pleasure to have you here at Kaust. Thank you. Right. And you know, research at its best is um, really nirvana. nirvana. <laughs> it's nirvana. Yeah. So you have to achieve it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, you become one with yeah. the universe. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so. that, that's a very great perspective we have. <laughs> so at its best, it doesn't always happen, <laughs> but it's very spiritual, very spiritual. Um, yeah, and let me maybe just um, ramble on a little bit on that point. Um, from my own personal experience uh, you know I went to graduate school and I chose a very difficult project and um, I knew I could fail because it was so hard but I didn't care I just wanted to do something difficult and important and um, so when I succeeded at 2 a.m. Uh, some Saturday night um, I knew with certainty that I'm the only person in the world that has data like this. Okay, and and that and that was a, that was a very powerful experience. I mean, yes, it, in other fields like the perovskites, you most likely because it's so crowded and big, you may never have that certainty at the time you get the data. <laughs> but uh, I had that, and and uh, it was very powerful. And yeah, I can feel it right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like, yeah, and and that, that's the beauty of science in many ways is that these are singularities. You create new knowledge, right? Like, you know, you want to climb Mount Everest, be number 250 in 2018. You know, what I mean, <laughs> what's the fun in that, right? That's true. You know, you climb your own mountain in science, you're the first one. That's it. So, whoever's watching this, uh, <laughs> go out there, find your mountain, <laughs> climb it. <laughs> That's really good. I'm, I'm very happy with this interview. Thank you. Thank okay, you you're most welcome.